Hey friend, Carm Capriato here, and welcome to Remarkable Results Radio. This episode marks the 500th episode, Whoa, a huge milestone of the Automotive Aftermarket's premier podcast. This is for sure a special episode with six of your industry peers who are sharing important milestones of their very own. And you'll find a huge benefit, as you've come to expect, with the podcast. Profit sharing is the fastest way to grow technicians. Every technician in your building is in their best interest to help the next guy, and more specifically, the youngest, greenest guy. Let's get him as many skills as we possibly can, as fast as we can. Um, And oh, by the way, that young green guy doesn't get to come in and be a kid. He has to come in and act like a professional. Welcome, aftermarketers, to Remarkable Results Radio. Listen to learn just one thing from today's episode on your journey to remarkable results. Hi, friends. Carm Capriato. Now, you know that Apex 2019 is done, and it's over. It's in the record books. And I must say that Apex did live up to presenting leading-edge technology from suppliers, but also a great job they did of showcasing the emerging technology of tomorrow. They covered it A to Z. Now, you've got plenty of time to plan for 2020. Get that calendar out. It's November 3rd through the 5th, 2020. Get to Apex now more than ever. Hey, just one word of housekeeping. I know how much of a fan you are to all the podcasts that we create. That we just made a huge move and split all three shows, all three formats into their own podcast subscription feed. So all you need to do to get all of the content that you're missing is to go to your listening app, most likely the one that you're listening to now, and search for the Town Hall Academy and subscribe to it, and also the For the Record podcast and subscribe to it. There's also another option that may work on some listening apps. Type in my name and you'll find all the shows. Carm Capriato. Now, thanks for doing that. Get on board. I sure appreciate it. Hey, sharing the 500th episode with me is Amy Matinat, Judy Zimmerman-Walter, Jerry Kazaya, Brett Beachler, Kirk Richardson, and Dwayne Myers. Hey, I'm honored that they joined me in this milestone episode, but... I must thank all the guests who have ever graced the Remarkable Results Airwaves, and I thank them for contributing their insights and talent to help the industry and and to bring their voices for all to hear. I would have never, never imagined this without them. In this episode, I asked the team just two questions. The first one was, in the last five years, share just one thing that worked for you. And also, what's one thing that didn't? You're going to be surprised by some of the answers. And as always, the talking points for this show are done for you, and you can access them at remarkableresults.biz slash E500. 500. Wow, that has a ring to it. In total, Amy, Judy, Jerry, Brett, Kirk, and Dwayne have contributed 45 episodes from all three podcast genres out of the about 782 that we've done total. Now, this episode serves up some really good insights that I know should prompt you to look introspectively where you are and where you're going. It may be to help you find a different path or decide to take the road less traveled. You know, success for you depends on what happens in between your attempts at doing. So pay attention to the details, the dynamics, and read between the lines in this episode so you don't get left behind. This is one of the most transparent and emotionally inspiring episodes we've done in a long time. And I thank my guests for giving of themselves so that all ships rise. And I couldn't have done this without you, my listener. Thank you so much. And for all the sponsors that we've had over the last five years. Enjoy. Hey, a warm welcome to an unbelievable cadre of guests here for the 500th episode. I have to tell you guys, this is this is a, a place that I never thought I would ever be in. And uh, when we started uh, just about five years ago, the, in about three more months, it'll be five years that we did this. And it has been an incredible ride, but more than anything, it's been what I've learned, I think what the industry has learned, and the drive and the purpose that we have set to lift all ships get all ships to rise and to pass wisdom forward and to have people come on the show and speak their passion and talk about what's important to them and and share an idea. 
So we pulled together a heck of an interesting panel of six what I call essential voices of the aftermarket. Amy Matinat from Auto Craftsman in Vermont is with us. Hey, Amy. Cheers. Judy Zimmerman uh, Walter from Zimmerman's Automotive. Hi, Judy. Hi. Jerry Kazaya, the Auto Shop, Texas, Plano. Brent Beachler from Beachler's Vehicle Care and Repair, Illinois. Hey, Brett. Hello, Carm. Good to have you here. Kirk Richardson, South Street Auto Care up in Michigan. Hey, Kirk. Carm, congrats on 500. Uh, thanks, man. Appreciate that. Dwayne Myers, Dynamic Automotive, Maryland. Um, good to have you here, man. Thanks, Carm. Appreciate it. I uh, did some homework. I did a lot of homework. I really had to find out how many episodes you all have been on and shared to the industry over the last five years, the 500 episodes. And it's really more than that because you you not only came on to remarkable results, you came on to Town Hall Academy and for the record. And uh, Town Hall Academy is, of course, our single subject a forum. Uh, we, you know, we tear apart a single subject. And for the record, this really cool rant show that you can share an opinion or two. And, uh, you know, altogether, 782 some episodes that we have going and you know, we recently split the shows into their own feeds because there's a lot going on in the world of podcasting and there's a lot going on with me and where I'm taking the podcasts, plural. Uh, what I would really like to do is to continue the story and, you know, how we share ideas and everybody wants to know, hey, what did this person think of what's going on there? So I said, why don't we talk about in the last five years of your business, tell us just one thing. I mean, it's so hard to pick just one thing, but one thing that worked. And, uh, you know, what did you learn about it? And then one thing that didn't work. I love the, looking at the yin and the yang of things because a lot of us are so proud of the good stuff that worked. But we also said, that hurt and it wasn't right. But I learned from it and failing forward is a great idea. Hey, Amy, we'll start with you. What's one thing that you can share with the industry uh, that, that really worked for you in the last five years? I'm in the Northeast, the rust belt. Cars rust away. They get so rusty. I always have, uh, we do a lot of tires. So there's very cyclical part of the business. Tire season, we're crazy busy. And then January, February, March, April, there's, we're slow. And then we get back into tire season and then we come into the summer and it slows down a little bit. But finding a good person to do the tires and to keep them because they're kind of like your C-Tech. We didn't have enough business to keep them busy all the time. So I was always looking for what could I add to the business to keep this person and then turn them into an apprentice and grow them but have them pay their way. So I discovered undercoating. We came up with the idea because I've got five loaner cars and I got a plow truck and a shuttle vehicle and I own four vehicles. And uh, I was tired of them just rusting away. So I was like, we need to undercoat. And my staff was like, no, 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 no. Because undercoating can be really gross if you don't have the right product. And so I just kept bringing home different products and we would try it out and it would like be toxic. It would make a mess. We couldn't find anything. And then, you know, it's all about talking and sharing. And uh, I ran into Diane Larson from Larson Automotive in Massachusetts. And we were talking and I was like, I got to find a good undercoating product. And she said, corrosion free undercoating out of Canada. I've been doing it for eight years. It's amazing. So I called up to them and they sent me a sample and we tried it and my staff was blown away. And it's a high grade mineral oil base. So it's non-toxic. There's no smell. Making any money? Yeah. Yeah. It's got great profit. Don't margins. you just love that when someone says, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you have to reapply it every 18 months. So they have to come back and it's been incredible new customer acquisition because people who wouldn't ordinarily come to the shop because they have their, you know, they've been going to the dealer, they've been going to the same place forever and they have loyalty, but no one else is using the corrosion-free undercoating that we use. So they come in and then they look around and, you know, of course we do a courtesy inspection and they come back 18 months later and... We get cars from Connecticut, and they can be very rusty because they're using salt brine all on the Northeast. Hey, thanks for that. Excellent idea. Kirk, what's going on? What's, uh, what's the big thing, uh, good positive thing in the last five? For us and my shop, we, uh, we did a 
uh, profit sharing plan. I've talked about it on the show before, but it's a hundred percent profit sharing. So all 13 people involved in fixing cars in my shop uh, are profit sharing. So there's no flat rate. There's no individual commissions. There's no, this person sold, you know, gets their 7% of what they sold or any of that. And, and I think the big, the big philosophical takeaway is, you know, and I, I wrote it, you know, the power of the collective is much greater than one or two talented people. Um, you know, and that's, that's something that, you know, I don't know, maybe I always thought, um, never really had the, uh, the ability to execute it. But once, once we put something like that in place, and that was almost six years ago at this point, five plus years ago. Kirk, is this on gross margin or net profit? So, I mean, we call it gross profit. I mean, it's not a, a true definition of the term gross profit, but the, the plan is essentially called the gross profit sharing plan is you know, a generic term we use for it, but it's on, it's on company-wide gross profit. It made a big difference in the company. I mean, you, you say the collective effort, so everybody's mm-hmm. in on on the, on the culture, the people, you know, they're, they're, sure. they're, they're playing every day like they own the business. Yeah. I mean, we have 14, 15 people, including me, you know, when they have a full-time admin person uh, pointed in one direction. And then you have a, a collective group of people trying to accomplish the same thing, which is, you know, essentially for us, make the customer happy. But in the end, that that's what produces gross profit dollars, which fully aligns with I think, most shop owners uh, or, or fully aligns with many shop owners' uh, key objectives, which is to be profitable. And you know, I, I will take uh, the 13 people that I work with every day versus any other shops, one or two talented people. Kirk, we hear a lot about the coaches come on and, and some of the very successful shop owners that made these pivots and these hurdles in their business. And they say, you know, I finally had hit myself up over the head and stop realizing that I had a job and I had to become a business person. Was that an evolution to get where you are today? Uh, honestly, no. <laughs> I mean, give you an I'm, idea. I'm glad to hear that you walked in. You walked in as a business person, yeah. And 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 in a short time, you've had some unrivaled success. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I bought my first shop 15 years ago. I was always wired to be a business person. Uh, I was fixing cars, but I was always wired to be a business person. So I think that's been a, uh, from childhood, that's been sort of ingrained in me. So I love to hear that. Yeah. That was a, that was a pretty normal space for me. It's a fascinating concept. It works. I would, I would like to learn more about that. I make you uh, a call one day. Uh, you, I have a whole package literally uh-huh. on my desktop that I just send out to shop owners that contact I would love to it. see that. That's fascinating. To yeah, me too. Yeah, I think I would all like of us would be interested. Well. It's all math. I mean, in the end, there's lots of questions and a million questions in the mm-hmm. end. And how and how do you train? And I go, I, I have all the math. I can walk you through all the math. Um, yep. You know, the 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 soft skills of it or the, the soft side of it is pretty easy. Most people will buy into the, hey, you're the guy next to you is actually no longer the guy that is in competition with you. He's like your best friend. It's in your best interest to help him. And most people prefer to show up to work and behave that way. Mm -hmm. That's not the challenging part. It's amazing how I can pull some interviews off just the top of my head. (laughs) Out of 782 shows. But Kirk is one of them. And I remember Kirk saying to me, because of his program his pay plan his pay program the guy someone walks in and they're ready to buy tires and i'm the service advisor i'm not a good tire guy it's all team so i wait for bob to you know hey hey, listen bob really knows all about these these ice and snow tires or whatever they are and i want to get him here to work with you and it wasn't like this was going to be my ticket or not you put the you put the most talented person on Mm -hmm. the job I mean, within my shop, we had four advisors. One really does European and he likes European and he does it well. And everybody in the building says, let's move the European work that way. Um, not because people don't like it, but because we say, let's take the, the talent of this individual and try and exploit it um, for the good of everybody, customer included. Yeah, it's a win-win because they're happier because they're doing what they like and they're the best Always. at it. So yeah, it makes Always. sense. Yeah. If you get someone inside the company, Kirk, that doesn't get it he's always been if you will the point of a plow and now he's on a team have you had some issues with that yeah we fire them do you have to Pretty fire straight. them or do they quit themselves uh we fire them before they even get a chance to quit and we onboard people in a unique way i mean we onboard people basically with a salary for three to six months 
no one quits in this industry when they have a salary. That's uh, I've right. yeah. <laughs> I've unfortunately learned that. Uh, that that's something else I've learned. <laughs> Yeah. So no, we, we're generally the we're generally the people that have to do that. But they know it's never a shock to them. Forty years of running a shop, I've never had anybody go. What do you mean I'm fired? Yeah, I, I, <laughs> they they yeah. know it long before we. They do, do yeah. Mm-hmm. So. And half the battle is pulling that trigger sometimes. Yeah, I think that's the biggest battle. It's not half the battle because you know yeah. at the end of the day, we want to be liked. We want to be you know we we want to be the nice people. So we we overcompensate and we allow a lot of times we allow people to get away with things that we normally would not allow right i mean i would let my kid do that but i got this guy doing that and it's okay great point jerry judy what's one big great exciting thing in the last five years well i don't know if it's big great and exciting but one of the biggest things that changed some things for us is um just a little history i took the business over from my father it was started in 58 Things were done a lot differently than he did. You did things the way he said you did them because that's just the way it was then. And you shut up and you did your job. And that was family and non-family. But one of the things that when I took over is I, I thought it was so important to have input from the staff, shop staff. Now. And so I started having morning meetings. And these were not meetings to discuss the day so much as to tell me a little bit about um, what you're seeing in the market and what you think we should be doing differently, like 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 marketing, um, different Facebook things, that kind of thing. And also things like we were having so much trouble with communication. So I started having the people tell me, okay, yesterday the aligner's not working right. And it's like, you got to get that, that note to the right person so that it can get fixed. And so we started to have the, it's those kind of meetings. They morphed into some, we, we still have other kind of meetings too, but to have the kind of meeting where you just, you know, tell a little bit about how the, you know, something bad that will happen yesterday or something good that happened yesterday. And it's also a nice time too, that you can really compliment. Like one time we had a problem. We have a out of sales division, a shop division and a quick loop division. And somebody in the quick loop that made a, a pretty bad mistake and they put, the wrong plug and they got it known and right away they they came back and told the man the service manager the loop manager got the service manager right away they, and they were all on it i had three guys on top of this vehicle and they fixed and they, they they corrected the mistake the next day i just i thanked them all and i told them that is what a team does this is what a team does we we help each yep. other we got your back those morning meetings just helped to build a team a little bit better it was no longer joe and john and and whoever out for themselves. It was like kind of everybody together and it really brought the group together. Thank you. You know, I want the listener to realize why we're doing this. It's the 500th episode of Remarkable Results Radio that we started March, 2015. And these ideas that are coming out in this conversation that you're going to hear, that you've already heard and you're going to hear more of, is really what we do here. We share ideas. We share wisdom. The essential voices of the aftermarket say, hey, I've never had a platform before to talk about these things. Now you can maybe read them in an article in in a in a paragraph or two, but it's nothing like hearing the emotion and the voice and hearing some of the why behind the stories. So we've heard about undercoating. We've heard about great pay plans. We've heard about meetings. None of these are probably, oh, God, um, I've never heard of that before. But if this may fire you up, charge you up, light the fuse of your firecracker, this is what we do. So I I want you to recognize uh, that some of the things that we do here on the show, we do over and over again. Because, you know, while we have new listeners all the time, it's been five years, there's 500 episodes, because there's a different perspective as time goes on. There's different ways to look at these kinds of ideas. There's been an evolution in businesses and what worked back then doesn't work today. So we're here trying to help build the business side, the entrepreneurial side of our industry. And I, I, I said that in, in the beginning, uh, I, I, I kind of looked up how many episodes everyone was on and Amy, uh, 10 episodes in the last five years. And why would you have Amy on 10 times? Because Amy has those different kinds of perspectives and all the different things you were on with soft skills, back office stuff, women, car care clinics. I mean, great, great stuff. Judy, six 
episodes, and, and maybe maybe I missed one or two. You talked we talked about cannabis. You remember that one about about workplace uh, cannabis? Oh my god, it was, that was just this maybe three two months ago. <laughs> um, su- succession planning. You heard Judy say family business. Oh my god, I, I I've been there. I was an sob, son of boss. I, I was once, and, and I get all that. And um, Kirk, five episodes. And um, we talked about technician pay, of course, your great plans and you know, hiring for a cultural fit, uh, revving up your business uh, culture and performance reviews. And oh, by the way, go to the website, type in performance reviews and listen to this episode that we did with Kirk. It was at, I think it was Town Hall Academy, Kirk. And it's the time of the year that we should be thinking if you're if you're doing annual performance reviews, you need to start thinking about that. If you do ongoing performance reviews, then you should be doing them all the time. If you do quarterlies, the point of it is, is that you can't get by today and growing a great business without sitting down with your people and doing a 360. Am I right? Right, Kirk? 360, yeah. right? We do them pretty regularly. Yeah. And that was a great, that was a great, uh, great episode. Let me see if I, the Town Hall Academy 127 was, was, was that one on performance reviews. So Jerry, besides he's drinking wine with me today on the 500, thank you very much for indulging with me. Cheers. Yeah, cheers. I've been an absentee owner for a long time. And uh, the one thing that I know for sure we absolutely have to do is we have to inspect what we expect and we have to constantly be training. And, you know, it doesn't matter how long someone's been with you, right? I've, I've got a technician has been with me for 25 years as of January 15 and great guy, love him to death. And we still have our weekly meetings and we still go over the basics, even with him. And, you know, if we ask the questions, we have, we call it the 500% rule, and we can talk about that at another time. But we make sure that everybody around the table understands what it is, what we believe that it takes to run a successful shop and to take really good care of our clients. And, and it really is inspecting what we expect and constant ongoing training. You know, Jerry came on a, a while back, Jerry, I think it was August 2015, and you started to talk about how much, uh, how many vacations you went on. And, you know, it was almost like you had this little chart on the wall. <laughs> I actually do have a chart on the wall. I, I get my uh, annual uh, annual calendar. It's uh, 24 inches wide, 30 inches is long. And we've I've already got uh, things marked out all the way through December of 2020, my non-negotiable days that I am not in the office. Last year was a light year. We were at 94 days. The year before was 141 days outside of the business. This dead air was on purpose. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, did I lose my microphone again? <laughs> and that's just like, yeah. wow. Yeah, that, that's that's why you put yeah. dead air in in a, in a conversation uh-huh. when you. That was an awe moment. Yeah, it was. It was. A, it was. A, it was a, so how the hell is Jerry doing that? Uh, again, please go listen to anything that we've ever done with Jerry Kazaya, K-E-Z-H-A-Y-A. I mean, you've got to just type in Jerry K and see all of his episodes and, and listen to his passion as to how he's, he's grown his business to be this. Well, and, and I want to add to it that until two years ago, my wife and I had seven companies that we were running simultaneously while maintaining an average of 120 days a year travel. So, I mean, that's, you, again, you have to ex- inspect what you expect. And I get, I mean, there's, there, there, it'll be a, a, convers- a lesson or a episode all to itself, Carm. Why don't we, why don't we plan on doing that? Because I'm, I'm, I'm as curious, I, I'm sure our listeners would say, you know, may, maybe you and I should do a series on how we can remove ourselves from our business. I would love to do that. I really would. Because I, I'm going to tell you, you know, if you want to get rid of, uh, you know, overwhelm, if you want to get rid of burnout, if you want to get rid of you know, all of that stuff, uh, you've got to, you've got to be able to take time away from the business. And you, and that means no emails, no text messages, no phone calls. You've got to step away from it. Otherwise you never get a break. And if you don't get a break, I, I mean, at some point you go, I, I'm out. I can't do this anymore because it's 24 seven when you're on, right? So you got to step away. Well, thanks for that. I appreciate that. And somebody who I believe knows how to do that, uh, Dwayne Myers. Dwayne, um, 
We've, uh, we, we actually, I think it was, I have to keep my head on straight. Last Friday, we put out an episode, right? And on dynamic leadership, the name of the business is Dynamic Automotive. And we interviewed Dwayne and, and three of his people. And uh, it was a phenomenal episode. And I, I, I believe, Dwayne, you'll be like Jerry one day because you're growing multi-store operation. Great. You're, gr- you're growing a great team. So thanks for being here. By the way, Dwayne is... Uh, Jerry's my new mentor. Yeah, I know. Uh, and mine too, by the way. Uh, Dwayne's been on the podcast over the last five years. One of the, he, Dwayne and his partners were on episode two. Nice. Episode two. Three great people, great partners. And uh, it's it's just been a great ride. And just for me to watch how your company has grown and what you guys have done with your team and uh, your new buildings and what a no pun intended, dynamic business that you have. So tell us your one big takeaway here. That was difficult. I've gone all over the place with this one. Apprenticeship would be easy, but that was the beginning. I think really gold map reviews where we actually started doing reviews. We went away from the one to five rating system to a uh, goal-based asking our team what their goals were for their career for the next one, three, and five years. And that started the process of us creating career paths, which was a lot about the episode that you just released last Friday, where we had three examples there yeah. uh, of basically from the beginning, hopefully to the end of their career of where they want to go and how we're going to help them get there. And I think that has changed our company uh, and grown it and done more for us than anything in the last five years. Uh, so just changing the way we reviewed our team really opened everything up and you know, I had a hard time getting Lee and Jose to change because they were used to the old way. I was okay with it, uh, being a little younger, uh, not much, but a little, but, uh, man, what a difference it made. I think you and I talked about that in, um, one of your episodes. Was that episode 222? Uh, that was one episode we did. Yeah. You went uh, deep into, uh, you know, how you changed as a leader and, and, and how, you know, your people impacted you and, you know, how you sense that. And, you know, you had a change too. Oh, absolutely. Once you stop, start worrying about them leaving and you start looking at where they want to go. And, and if they want to leave in three years, it's okay. You know that you have them for three years and, and you, you help develop them as best you can. And if they leave, well, you know what? Great. Good luck to them. But more than likely they don't because you've invested in them in the last couple of years. And they decided that this is a good place, a good industry Show them that, you know, we are good. We, we can do a lot of great things and how amazing the automotive aftermarket is. They, they, most of our people have no idea until we take them out into the to Apex or, or to some of the industry events how great this industry is. It, it's amazing. Uh, you know, we live in our little four walls. We don't realize how massive and, and what a big powerhouse we are. When Dwayne says we, he engages his people in the industry... Uh, and takes them to conferences. He, he's serious. You guys spent a lot of money on that, but you also have created a, a cohesive family. Yes, actually, we're. Uh, I'd have to say we are very tight, very close, um, uh, and we're open to new people. I mean, it's not like we're a clique where you you can't just come in. Uh, we've learned, you know, new blood. I'm I'm a fan of new blood because they bring new ideas. You know, there's there's going to be listeners out there. We, we gain new listeners all the time. I, I, I get cards and emails and letters all the time, and they say, where have you been? I can't believe it. I can't believe I have to listen to all these. And I say, no, let me tell you. Tell me what you, your pain points are, and I'll, and I'll steer you. And there's people that come on that, that have been naysayers, that, that I think they want to pick themselves up, but they sit and listen. you got to be kidding me. I, I, I got to. I got to be a leader and, and I got I to gotta build and create a family here. I just want to go work on cars. What do you say to them? It's a business and it has to be run like one. And something I found interesting, you know, 500 episodes. So I went on your website and I got to dig in a little bit and I'm like, all right, well, what has 500 podcasts gotten us? So I, I scrolled through some of the ones, you know, I typed my name in, uh, I Google, I Carm, Carm Googled my, my name and a bunch of things pop up and I go down to the bottom and I look at all your hashtags and I see business development. So I, I'll take that one hashtag. I type that in or clicked on that. There's like 10 pages of episodes mm-hmm. of just on business development. That, that could be a four-year college. 
Mm-hmm. You know, it was a uh, quite amazing the depth of that one topic, which yeah. is so important to all of us. It is, and, and that's the, it, one of the toughest challenges that I have in producing the podcast is to sit at the end just before I click the the the, the publish button is to figure out what the key words are in the discussion. What were the key words so that when you could go back and and click on business development, culture, um, profitability, gross margin, wh- whatever those key words are, because that's a pain point you'd love to listen to. And thanks for bringing that up. Mm-hmm. It's amazing the contributions from the industry to help the industry. I have to say that anyone who's ever been on the podcast is the most selfless people that I know. They're just givers. And 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 I and and I think they saw what what I wanted to do with it. And I think they said, "Hey, we can get on this bandwagon." Well, you know, Carm, I I believe that at this point, I think everybody in the in the podcast is running a successful business, and for me, as a successful business owner, I just want to help people. You know, I mean, it's no longer, for me, it's no longer about money. It's about how do I serve? How can I help? How can I teach? How can I bring other people up to where I'm at, to the level that I'm at, or even, you know, stand on my shoulders, be higher than me. Right. I mean, a lot of people, and and a lot of people think that it's a, a, the, the pie is finite, right? It's not, it's a river of money that continues to flow. And just reach in and grab some. There's enough for everybody. Let's let's help everybody get there. I mean, that to me is is what I'm supposed to be doing. It's, it's God put that on my heart, and I'm I'm running with it. And it's in our DNA. I mean, just think about what we do. Just having yeah. an auto repair shop. We keep we keep people safe business. on the. Yes, that's what we do. We keep our customers safe. We take care yeah. of them, and so it's just a continual piece of that, kind of spreading out a little farther. Is not only do we keep our customers safe, we take care of our staff, and we help other shop yeah. owners be successful. Also, it just you know it just kind of all merges together. Bravo! I tell our employees when we have new employees that come in, I say, listen, it may look like an auto repair shop. And you may think that's what we do, but what we do, what we do here in this company is we save people's lives. Mm-hmm. We make sure you don't have a blowout on a tire. You know, you don't have a ball joint break loose on at 80 miles an hour. Uh, you know, we make sure that everybody that leaves our shop is safe. Mm-hmm. That's For what we hospital. do. I, I always say that, you know, I have car doctors and we're a car yeah. hospital and we do maintenance and we do 911s and we take care of people. That's what we do. You know, when you tell your new employees and, and remind your old folks that our charge, our business is saving people's lives, mm-hmm. it, it really takes it to a different level. I mean, it's, I'm not just turning wrenches. I'm not just, you know, I'm not hanging a set of brake pucks, you know. I mean, I'm making sure that this person and their family make it to where they're supposed to go in one piece. This is huge for me. I mean, I just think that this is game changing. Mm-hmm. I agree. The Apex 19 is in the record books and brought the best and brightest together to create an experience like no other. Now, I was so impressed with the impact Apex has in presenting emerging technology. They are on the cutting edge of the connected car, and you'll find everything you need to know on what you'll need to do to stay ahead of the curve. Regarding emerging technology, Apex will feature again in 2020 the latest trends that will have an impact on the service professional and equipment. Wow, see, feel, and touch the latest tools and equipment that will bring efficiencies to your business. And in 2020, there's going to be a separate section dedicated to the service professional shop. It'll be called Repair Shop Headquarters, and it's the place to be if you earn your living in the aftermarket. And for training, Apex will present some of the best aftermarket technician and management trainers in 2020. So mark your calendar right now. Put the date on it. Apex 2020, November 3rd through the 5th in Las Vegas. Listen right here to learn all about the exciting events and when you can start registering. It was uh, it was two weeks ago. We did a Town Hall Academy. David Johnson, DJ, was on with us, and he talked about his really cool battery program. Keeping in mind, Jerry, what you just said, we never, ever, ever want you to have your vehicle not start. So here's the deal. We're going to install this battery. Here's what it costs to put it in, and you'll never need another one. And when you come every year, we're going to have this chart, and we're going to make sure that we test that battery. And if whatever 
that thing we we realize will will not get you into the next season or the next year, you get a brand new one. NC, no charge. Beautiful. I love that. I'm making notes. And, and so I asked the question that I knew the answer to. I basically said, so, David, um, say that battery costs you 100 bucks every four years. Well, that would be $25 a year. Where do you chalk that up to? Marketing? And he says, absolutely. That's where we expense the battery, to marketing. <laughs> marketing and retention. Yep. And uh, and he said, and, and it goes back to that. You have a home here. You have a home here. I get all warm inside when I hear the things you guys are talking about. And I wrote down the word sisterhood and brotherhood because because we want to be givers and we want to help each other out. And I think we have started to realize that if there's the top twenty percent of our industry, and there's a bunch that are really climbing and clawing to become better at it, that top twenty percent wants to help you. They really, really do. They want to give back because they they recognized what it took for them to go from the deepest depths of ugliness up to success. They continue to work at it all the time and they want and they want to help. And they want to help people not realize that they have a job, but they have a career, they have a business, that, and there's a lot of profits to be made in this business. And families get survived and, and fixed and, and, and together and, and, the, and the paychecks that you're providing to your team and your people. And I, I think we're making a difference in this industry for everyone who wants to help people move forward in their lives. Uh, I, uh, I, I, think, I think it's working. Jerry, uh, six episodes with us. Uh, we did one on Emith. Uh, you were on the 100th milestone. Thank you for coming back on the 500th. Oh. We talked about work-life balance, firing customers, paying techs 100 grand a year. So great, great wisdom. Thank you so much for those podcasts. And hopefully we can do a series on something else. Brett, um, glad to have you here. Uh, three episodes with us. Uh, we met back February 17. So what's going on with your big takeaway? Well, I had a few of them, but the, one of the top ones is uh, the advisor pay system. What you got to understand is the history at our company has um, not been focused up until a few years ago on KPIs for advisors. So we kind of would pay people about what we feel like they were worth. And uh, in the last few years, what has gone on is I've been the workhorse as an advisor, which I'm in the process of hiring an, advi an advisor to get me off the front counter. And while well, Brett will do it, he'll handle it. Um, he's co-owner of the business, so let him take all the sales. Well, what I did is um, create a system that's pretty... It's a, it's a complex spreadsheet, but it's super simple. You enter sales, you enter car count, um, you enter, um, it turns out hours per RO. I measure Google reviews. I pay guys for Google reviews. Um, they get bonus incentivized on, incentivized on, uh, uh, certain things. They get a percentage of sales. What it boils down to is they get paid hourly because we want to be compliant, um, with the, the feds and they get a bonus production, uh, that goes along with it. So the mix is about 60, 40. What I find is we belong to elite uh, pro service and we do shop visits twice a year. And I go into a shop and we go in and study it for a half a day. Some of us go in early and study the shop for a full day and observe the interaction with advisors and customers and try to help them figure out where their, the holes of their business are. And it is almost 100% of the time I can sit there and watch an advisor work with a customer and I, with multiple customers. And I stop and I, I pull the owner to the side. He's part of the group. And I say, hey, how do you pay your advisors? Well, their salary or their heavy hourly, where they get paid like 90 to 95% of their pay comes from their hourly pay and 5 to 10% of it comes from a little bit of bonus production here and a little bit there. And almost every single time when they have a lag in their business, when they have opportunity that is abound and they can't see it, it's because of the frontline person that is serving the customer. When I see that mix go toward like a 50-50, and when I say 50-50, I have to explain myself, 50% of their pay comes from their hourly pay and 50% of it comes from the bonus production of how you make that business move forward. Let's face it, we as owners, how are we paid? Do we get paid a big fat salary and just sit around and watch our companies you know, gr barely grow? 
or do we get paid based on the net profit of the company and how well we're doing? And of course, we all allocate salaries to ourselves and all that good stuff and blah, blah, blah. But in the end, we're based off of the profitability of our business. Why would the people that work with us side by side not be any different in terms of motivation for what they do. So our system is such to where right now it's a 60-40, 60-40, excuse me, as sales grow, that will go, it'll meet more toward a 50-50 mix. And there's a bigger carrot in front of my guys to where I'm not the one carrying the load all the time and I love it. And as we hire our third advisor coming in, um, I believe the system is going to help steer itself. Um, I've shared it with probably a half dozen of my my friends around the elite world because I have it on a Google um, a Google uh, Sheets drive, and it, it makes my job a lot easier, and it takes the pressure off of me. And, and quite frankly, you saw my list, Carm, that I sent over. My my whole genre is getting one of these gents that have 142 days away from the business for crying out loud. Um, I, I want to get there someday too, but I, you don't do that without building good quality systems. You don't do that without building. Um, a carrot type system in front of everybody that they can sell ethically to our customer base and keep growing our customer base. And that's really what it boils down to it. It's kind of like the book, uh, Good to Great. Everybody's got to be on the bus pushing this thing. Not just me, not just a couple key people in the organization. Everybody's got to do it. I think one of the Kirk was talking about, you know, percentage of gross profit. I think that's genius. Same kind of concept is, is what we're on too, but ours is a percentage of sales. Yeah, but Brett, I, you're you're spot on on the fact that you know our companies do not owe us owe us anything. What we get is what we earn, and, exactly. and as, right. as the business, as the as the CEO of the company, our job is to allocate and spend money properly. And whether you spend money for employees or whether you're spending money for rent or your you know insurance, whatever it is, we as the CEO, it's my job to make sure that I spend it as as I'm going to say miserly as I can keep my expenses low because the only way that I get, that I get paid is with what's left over, right? Yeah. This whole idea of pay yourself first, that's great. But the truth of it is you pay yourself out of, out of a business if, if you're not careful and you're not running a business like a business and you have to take care of people so that you have money at the end of uh, the end of the day so that you can pay yourself what you're worth, what, what you've actually earned. Absolutely. Carm, you've had Mike Davison on here. We're in the process of making it compliant from a wage and hour standpoint. You know how he's got his, uh, you know, his overtime stuff figured out. Um, and we've got a sheet that gets tied into each employee that's tied into this. Um, it, it's just, it, it, it's a, unfortunately, this is the direction we have to go from a wage and hour standpoint. But I, I want to be compliant just like the next guy does. So guys in the front line too. It's, it's, they're starting to see, hey, if we have a bad week, you should feel it too. I feel it, yep. <laughs> you know, and yep. when it's, it's when people get, and I know this sounds com, comes off kind of sounding a little crass when people get burned like that, because all of us on this call have been burned where we have bad sales. And it's like, Oh man, that one hurt. Like our net profit was really bad. Like I'm not going to be able to take a paycheck home. It changes us. And when our employees feel the same thing, when you have a bad week, it changes them for the better. Oh boy, I got to figure out how I can build better rapport with customers, build better relationships with customers. Ooh, I got to get better at this. I can't rely on the company to figure all the stuff out for me. And that and that, right. that's really what I'm driving. I'm not driving anything else. I'm driving the whole team pushing this bus forward. Great advice, Brett. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> hey, team, thank you for all of that. It was great to uh, you know get a perspective on uh, you know something that worked. Let's kind of go around the room and find out one real quick thing that didn't. And what was something you learned from that, Amy? My big not, you know, learning the hard way uh, the last five years was uh, there's part of me that wants to sell the business. You know, I go back and forth. Now I'm, I made five more years, five more years. I've, I'm committed to the team. But uh, about a year and a half ago, I had a bite from a big franchise company. It was a tire company. They're all over the Northeast and they had no blueprint in Vermont and they were excited. And they came up, the two head guys from the whole franchise, they looked at the business, they looked at my numbers and they put a pretty nice number on a piece of paper and pushed it across the desk at me. And it got me excited, you know, the number got me excited. But when I really looked at their business, my business is very unique. 
I call it my second living room. My staff is all, they're all spoiled rotten. I love them. I love my customers and it was going to get turned into, you know, a McDonald's and it just hurt my stomach. So I, you know, at the last minute I said, I'm sorry, I can't do it. I have to listen to my gut. So painful lesson. Um, but the falling forward is I realized that it's really important to me that when I sell the business, I sell it so that it's a win-win for, you know, my staff, for my customers, my vendors, and myself. And so that was my big, my big fall on my face. Uh, but I did get up and I'm committed for five more years. Ever look at an internal succession opportunity? I keep looking for the right person. I just haven't found him yet. Always, always right. looking. Amy, we still need you around. You, you, you got to stay at least five more years. Five more years. Yeah. Well, good. Let me write that down. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let me see. Well, that would be two, 2025, Amy. You can't go yeah. anywhere. All right. Kirk, <laughs> Kirk, something, uh, something you learned uh, that didn't go right. Yeah. Uh, so you asked me earlier, is, uh, is it always just, uh, have I always essentially been a business owner or a leader? I think that was essentially the question. And I said, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I mean, I sucked at it 15 years ago. I don't know if I'm great now, but I know I was not very good 15 years ago. And, you know, something I've learned in, in the 15, 14 years of owning businesses, developing leadership, uh, grooming leadership, choosing leadership is painful. Uh, it is not easy. And, you got to look in the mirror every day. Right. Well, I mean, you have to be, you have to be somebody worth following yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, and when you choose a leader or you're trying to develop a leader and you're, you're trying to, and, and leadership is almost all soft skills. And I just learned I'm not, I don't know, I'm not particularly good at it, I guess. I'm not particularly good at developing leadership. Something I've learned in this, that is a perpetual process. There is no, you know, I'll read this book and now we're all great leaders. It, it doesn't work that way. Um, it is a it is an evolution that never ends. It's never a finished product. Mm-hmm. Myself and the leaders that I work with, we have lapses. We have lapses in judgment. We have lapses in execution. And uh, trying to be patient through all of that has been uh, has been something that I've had to learn and I've just not been great at. Um, and it's not gone all that well for me. Uh, I've I've made some mistakes in there, um, so so that's that's something I, I would I would put out there. Well, talk about being humble. Uh, do you have to have courage to be a good leader? Yeah, I, I say this all the time. Leading is is lonely space. Nobody you put yourself out there. You do. I mean, we we do we do morning meetings. We do a couple morning meetings every week. Every Thursday morning, we begin our meeting with praise. Right? So we just say, hey, what did you guys see that was praiseworthy? We have five core values. And we say, hey, let's try and align them with the five core values. And John, who runs my big shop in Rochester, he is uh, just universally loved, universally respected. Everybody thinks he's a great leader. Everybody thinks he's a great manager. And you know who never hears one word of praise? John. Not because they don't love him, not because they don't respect him. It's just what he does every day, day in, day out. I've noticed it and I've had conversations with him. I'm sure he's noticed it. He, he's, he's not going to say much. He's uh, no, it doesn't bother me. Um, other than it's lonely. Right? If you're doing it well, I think uh, being a leader can be pretty lonely space. It can have wonderful rewards and horrible downs, but it, it can horrible be lonely downs, space, but... which does require some courage, uh, requires some courage to stay in that. Does he get praise from you, Kirk? Oh yeah. 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 I mean, we, we share an office, so, you know, we get to we get to pat each other on the back every now and then, and you know, complain about some people, and then go, yeah, okay, now we're the assholes and, or the jerks. I mean, and uh, we'll, you know, uh, um, you know, we get to we get to look at ourselves and go, yeah, we're 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 the people that are wrong here. But yeah, yeah, of course. Um, and he gets praised. I mean, we do reviews, and uh, unanimously, his reviews are overwhelmingly positive. I mean, it's almost to the point where I just go, this is, this is, uh, this is obnoxious how much you guys want to be nice to this guy. Um, you know, they're not, and they're not so nice to me as a side note. Uh, they're, they're, <laughs> they're, they're far nicer to John, but it's just not talked about, but, but everybody else will receive praise pretty regularly and people spot things and see things and, um, you know, but. You know, yeah, you want to be the leader and you want to be the designated leader where the level of scrutiny is higher and all eyes are upon you. Yeah, it takes courage. 
Thanks for that. Uh, very, thanks for being very, very transparent uh, w- with that. Uh, it, it takes a lot of courage to say the things you did. Mm-hmm. Hey, Judy, uh, what'd you what'd you bump into? One of the biggest things is, is for me, as personally, is um, yeah, obviously I'm female in a male role, and 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 I and I've been doing it for a long time, so I, I don't even want to go there. But there's one thing that I found just in the past five years, we. As a company, we made a very large change in 2000. We moved to a very large building and we, we, had 20, we have 29 employees now. We went from about 10 to 29. And so had a lot of more new people. As the new people came, the Judy that ran, the, that sat in the front office, the one that was on the ownership team, was a person that um, they, they heard stories about. But as it goes along and it gets further, I still assume that everybody knows that I used to help. In, I used to work in the quick loop too. I used to change oil. I used to vacuum cars. I never worked on cars as in tune-ups that, and forward, but I did, I did some of the light duty. And I always find that with new employees, the biggest thing, my biggest mistake I make is to assume that they know that I have paid my dues too. And for some reason, that just seems to be really important to a new employee young to be sure that their boss has been there too, because it, it helps them to, to take what I say a little more seriously, to be willing to allow me to lead them when they know that I've been there too. And my biggest assumption, my biggest problem was I assumed that everybody knew that. But as as the years go along, it, it doesn't follow. So it's really important that I get out and I get to know them in the shop. And then I also, you know, can share some stories of when I when I did some of this. That, that's an interesting story, gang. That's 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 an interesting story. Yeah. I find my staff gets really happy when I go out into the shop, pick up a broom and sweep mm-hmm. out their bay or something. Mm-hmm. You know, go out there and yeah. and just fold the rags. <laughs> yeah. I'm in there. I'm with them. I'm working mm-hmm. with them. Mm-hmm. And just a little thing like that just makes such a difference. And then you're in their element, in their world. And I find it sometimes easier easier to talk to them about things. You know, G- Jerry, I, I got to ask a question. I'm very curious, Judy. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go a little deep on this, okay? So, so here's my question, and I'm going to go to you, Jerry. You've been kind of removed from the business. You, you talked about that. I, we know that about you. And a new person comes on. Do they have to know that you've been there and done that in your earlier days? You know, the Judy says that has to work for her. Does that happen in your place? You know, that's a really good question. Uh, I I believe, and I, I just have to speak from from my heart, right? I have to believe that when I'm talking to a technician about a job, and we're going over the steps or whatever it is we're talking about, mm-hmm. they're really clear. I know what the hell I'm talking about, right? Mm-hmm. My, my certifications are still hanging up on the, on the walls with theirs, right? I'm, I'm, I still have all the licenses and all this, the stuff to go with it. So I've not dropped that. But um, there are times when I'll be out in the shop and I'll be under the hood with them. You know, mm-hmm. white shirt. I don't care what I'm wearing. It's like you know what? I have a dry cleaner. They take good care of me. Uh, I'll, but I'll lean in under the hood and I'll do what I have to do. You know, because at the end of the day, when I'm at the shop, well, let me let me back up. When I am, wherever I am, I play 100. Mm-hmm. percent So when I'm in my coaching business, they get 100 percent of me. When I'm in my auto repair business, they get 100 percent of me. When I'm in my real estate. They get a hundred percent of them, right? So whatever business that it is that I'm doing, where, whoever I'm with, I'm in. I'm playing, right? I'm playing. I'm playing to the best of my ability, uh-huh. whatever that means. And and when you, when you're playing at that level, how can they question whether or not I've been there, done that? Well, the more I think about your answer and then what you said, Judy, I you start. Judy started out by saying, "I'm a woman in a man's world," and I think I. What does that mean today? I don't know, but I it think, means a lot. It, it means more than you think. <laughs> that's why she said well, what wait, she wait, did. Wait, wait, I, wait, I, wait, I, wait, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hey, Laura, can you come here, please? I want you to be on camera. I want you to look at my little wife, who I love and adore. Hi, Laura. Okay, Hi, Laura. Laura. <laughs> Isn't she great? So my little wife runs the automotive business, one hundred percent. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and I don't. 
Judy is saying that she is a woman in a man's world in a man's role. And, and I don't know, do you get pushback uh, uh, as a woman in that role? I mean, she's, well, Laura, Laura runs the business. She's been running it since the end of February this, uh, of last year of 2019. I've been running my shop for about six years, but I've been at the company for 40, over 40 years as a, as a, a part of the ownership team. Yeah, an interesting family dynamic at Zimmerman's, and and of course you're in the country, uh, and there's a there's some there's family continued to be involved. So, uh, Judy, you have a very interesting dynamic, and thank you for being so transparent on that. I I appreciate that. One thing, that. Judy is is I know nationally you're a leader. Oh yeah. P- period. Oh, yeah. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, no offense to you and 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 Laura, Jerry, because you guys know I love you, but Laura has you there also. One of the things with me and Judy is just the girl dealing with just the girl. There's no guy here to um, to like you know say no, that's not okay. You listen to her. There's nobody saying you listen to her. We're mm-hmm. the ones saying you listen to me. So it, there's a little bit difference there. And being the only woman there, I think it is the dynamics are different. We have to gain their trust, their respect. And there's a lot of different strategies and it's continually changes. Don't you think, Judy, with the different generations? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, You get these young, you know, young bucks coming in. Um, It's a different generation. They have different ways that they think that it's, again, there's that learning curve of being a leader is you think you have it Mm -hmm. down and then the next generation comes in and you got to learn how to communicate to them in a different way. So I completely different way. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I mean, knowing all the women shop owners that I know around the country, th- there's a little bit of a difference to it. I think that we have to be more strategic in um, because we don't want to be mom. I mean, a lot of times everybody just wants yeah. to be the mom, and you, that that's not being the leader and the owner of of the business. You know, we haven't done a a very comprehensive all woman shop owner show in a while. I think we need to do one. Agreed. Schedule it. There is something that I would like to say. Would you come on, Laura, with uh, with us? Sure. 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 I would do that. So um, I've had a, a chance to think about uh, being a, a woman shop manager owner, and I and I respect and appreciate and agree that yes, I do have Jerry there to say, you do it. You know, do what she says. Um, and Judy, I respect that you've been in the business a long time, and I really admire that uh, because I'm new to it. There is still some stuff about men and women. I don't notice mm-hmm. it so much with my my employees, but I, I notice it a little bit with the customers because the customers are not expecting that I'm going to know anything about their car. Sure. Mm-hmm. Rightfully so, because I'm a doctor. I'm not a mechanic. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so, but but here here's the thing, though. And Amy, you said it. It's gaining their respect. That's a big part of it. That's a big part of it. And then there's also speaking their language. Uh-huh. I agree, because that's communication. Is is yeah. being right. able to have really good communication, and so then you have to change your language for all the different people. Yes. Yeah, and there is a book that for me was extremely helpful in learning about men and how to speak to men. And it's called The Queen's Code mm-hmm. by Alison Armstrong. Great book. And really, I kid you not, that has helped me in every relationship, both with men and with women, because it has helped me to understand men and what they think about and what they don't think about. And that's just a simple example. And it's helped me to understand the words that, that really speak to them and how, how, what motivates them. Because men are very extremely aware of the expenditure of their energy. And so I have to be careful about where I ask them to spend their energy. And when I do that, I get the best of them. Well, that's, that's some very heavy advice right there. I like it's that. Game changing, Carm. Really, wow. it's game changing. Great to great to have you, Laura. So, uh, how did Jerry come? Never mind. We'll, we'll, we'll <laughs> we're going to cover that. 
<laughs> and a completely different We've thing. All wondered that. Yeah, I, yeah. Wow, he is a salesperson. <laughs> Are you kidding? I still wonder. Yeah, come on. <laughs> uh, Dwayne, tell me. Thank you, Judy. Uh, Dwayne, tell me. Uh, tell me a, a big learning curve for you. My my learning curve is definitely deeper than five years. Uh, I can go back probably 10, 15, um, you know, we, we were burnt, you know, years ago and, and had a very bad taste, uh, for, for business for a while, uh, go back to episode two, three, and four and take a listen. Uh, it, it was a uh, pretty rough and, and I, I went in protection mode and it was a mistake. Uh, it might've been all right for a while, but I held on to it too long. Um, when we did those episodes, that was in our 20th year. And we hadn't grown in 10 years at that point. And we thought we were being successful. And what we found out, because within a year, we opened our fourth store. Of course, now you know we're hopefully Monday opening our brand new store we're building. Um, we were holding our team back. And when we opened that fourth store, we finally realized that, you know, I had some people come to me like, wow, we thought, you know, we love the company, but we thought we had hit our lid. And what Maxwell says we had hit our hit the ceiling in, in here. And we knew this was all we'd ever have. And I'm like, wow, I'd taken their dreams from them because I wasn't willing to grow. Um, part of that was fear, stubbornness. Um, but yeah, my biggest failure was me and not, not opening my eyes. I'd say for a while it was right, but I held on to it too long and slowly. And, and I'll, and I'll give, you know, part of the credit. There's a lot of the credit can be passed out and some of it can be in this run. And this right here or, you know, other podcasts listening to, but I finally opened up and realized that, that growth is what we need to succeed and to have a team worth worthwhile. You got to give them opportunities and you can't do it unless you're growing. Well, self-reflecting and cathartic. Well, courage. Thank you, my friend. Brett? We could go a lot of different directions with me, all the mistakes I've made. <laughs> you know, one of the things I, I, I say to myself is you can't do it all. I, I think we all in this show try to have at one point or another try to be heroes and think we can lift this heavy ship by ourselves and it's it's impossible i've learned to accept that one of the things that tipped me over the edge is um carm you might know this but my wife had a pretty bad car accident years ago and um she got she had a traumatic brain injury she was in the hospital oh boy it's probably uh, a few weeks and happened on a saturday night and at that time, I was carrying such a load in this business. And, I, and my dad and I have talked about this. We've worked through it. But I had nobody to turn to. And I went back to the business on a Wednesday. <laughs> and my wife didn't know her name. <laughs> wow. We've gone through like company culture things. And we went through some a couple of years ago. And I, I basically conveyed to the company the critical family error that I made because I felt like I was letting my my company down by not coming back. And don't get me wrong, my wife had a lot of support, her mom, kids, my mom. I mean, everybody was helping out. But I felt compelled, wrongfully so, to go back to the business because everybody was riding on my shoulders. And I explained a little bit earlier in the call, all the sales were riding on my shoulders. And I'm like, oh my gosh, my, I'm going to let my techs down. I'm going to let all my fellow employees down. And I will never, ever make a mistake like that again. That's really what drives me to get this stuff off my plate. Not that I want 142 vacation days a year. That would be nice. Why not? Why not? <laughs> Maybe I'll get there someday and I'm okay with having that goal. But it really drove me to say, don't ever let an organization of this size, and we hit, I don't know, 2.1, 2.2 million this year. Don't ever let an organization of this size completely ride on your shoulders because it is dangerous. It is dangerous. My wife and I have talked about it recently about how I failed her. And I, not like I'm a failure or anything like that, but it, it, there's a lot of cultivation that my wife and I had to do for years and years and years because of my decision to go back to the business. And I put the business ahead of my wife and that was wrong. And I, I'm just, it's full disclosure. That was probably one of the biggest critical errors I've made in my life. I have no problem telling people that story. I've told people in front of my elite pro service group of 30 people. I'm sitting there bawling in the group, not expecting to cry. And I want to tell them this story just so I could help other people. And, and it, it was just a critical mistake. It helped me. It, it's a, it's a driver for me to go, 
get stuff off your desk, get stuff off your desk, develop leaders, as Kirk says, can continue to develop leaders that carry the role that is needed to carry a business like this. Because my ultimate goal is to get this shop to about a $3.2 million shop and then possibly go out and multiply it. But I'm not ready for that yet. And I know that. So anyway, that was my big mistake. Sorry, I took too long to explain that. It is what it is. It's over and done with. And all, all we can do is learn from it, and not beat ourselves up. The purposeful long pause. Yeah, I knew very, that was very well said. And and uh, and you're talking at my heart here. Um, wow. Thank you for that, mm-hmm. Jerry. Can you top that? <laughs> no, I don't want to. But in the last five years, you know, I mean, for me, the the biggest thing that I think where we stumbled, where we dropped the ball, is we didn't fire fast enough. We didn't listen to our gut. We had people that we knew were not pulling their weight. They were not doing, you know, at the end of the job, at the end of the day, you know, you really have to listen to your gut. And when you're, when you're, when you hear your, your mind, your, your stomach, your, your gut telling you, this guy is slacking, this girl's not doing her job. There's, they're, you know, whatever the hell it is, don't get caught up in the media frenzy about, how there's no good people to, to hire. There's a lot of great people looking for a job. 60% of Americans today are looking for a different job because they're unhappy where they are. So whether you find someone who's unemployed or whether you find someone who's looking for a job, there's a lot of good folks looking for work, right? And we get caught up in the, oh my God, there's, there's a 2% unemployment and no one's looking, you can't find good people. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. You just got to step back and and take the leap of faith because I've always found that the folks are there when I really need them. The best way that we can think of our business really is more like a sports team, right? Do you want do you want a high performing sports team or do you want a not so performing? And you trade players out just like every other sports team does. And you say, you know what? Today, Amy, you're my star player. You're going to be my quarterback because. I know you can get me to the Super Bowl. And that doesn't mean you're, you're not good where you are, but if you can do it better for us and you can make more money, let's go. Everybody wins. So interesting what, what Jerry said. Uh, my, my takeaway for that, Jerry, is you're always building a Super Bowl team. I like always. that. You're always interviewing and recruiting and developing. Jerry uh, mentioned intuition and gut. Is this something you learn or something you just have? I think everybody I think has it. I think that some yeah. people just don't listen to it. It's learning. Right, exactly. It's learning to um, pay attention, to be introspective, to not be afraid, um, and that's all from experience. You know, when when you don't hi- fire that person that you should have even know that you know you knew that you were supposed to do it, and then you're like, I knew I should have. Always. Yeah. Then the next time it happens, you're like, hey, there's that, that feeling again. So the words trust your gut is something that comes with age or, or lear- you know, you realize you made a mistake or two and you say, ah, maybe I should listen to my inner soul next time. Carm, something interesting that I, you know, as I listen to everybody talk about, uh, you know, you know, failures, we'll use the term failures. Uh, they're almost all people related. I think they were all people related, actually. It wasn't, uh, <laughs> it wasn't this, uh, oh, I, yeah, I was buying parts from the wrong vendor and yeah. I screwed that up. And once I did that, I learned that I better buy the parts from the right vendor, uh, which I think lends itself to the people portion of our business and the soft side of our business is challenging. I mean, the soft side of life, right? The, the, the people side of life is, mm-hmm. uh, it's muddy, it's murky, it's, it's hard to navigate, but you got a bunch of successful shop owners, uh, you know, for people listening, a bunch of successful shop owners who are sitting here going, you know, it's really hard. And you know, we make mistakes on all the time <laughs> are people. people. Yeah. yeah. It's those people, um, you know, which is this, you know, you have to work at that. You constantly mm-hmm. have to evolve in that space. The, the, it's a people the, business. Yeah. Right. The, the the tactics of of running a shop, uh, a successful shop, are not overwhelmingly complex. I mean, you can do more complex things, but they're not overwhelmingly complex. The complexity comes when you start to add people. Um, and I, I think everybody in this group just said that. So. Speaking of people, we just started an apprentice program, 
and that's been a whole new learning curve because it's yeah. it's really becoming a coach and a trainer, mm-hmm. um, which is a whole nother side of, you know, normally I hire technicians who are smart and they can just, you know, my, my technician, I have three ASC certified master technicians and now I have an apprentice and I've been wanting to do an apprentice program for years, but you know, I was like, I don't know how to do it. And so just want to throw this out because I'm so excited about it is Napa Auto Care put together an apprentice program and it's like dialed in two years worth of online training. And the, the golden nugget was they have a toolbox with filled with tools for under $1,000, which is there's way more than $1,000 in the toolbox. And so the deal I made with my apprentice was you got to do everything because it's step by step by step, the online training. And then I have one of my technicians being their mentor. And at the end of our contract, if he did it all, the toolbox is his. He could stop the week before a toolbox, mine. And I looked in the toolbox and the tools are so nice that part of me is like, boy, I'd really like to have that toolbox. Um, <laughs> so we, we, ta- we banter about it, but uh, I'm just so excited about it because, you know, everyone's been talking about, you know, apprentice programs. You either have to, you know, steal somebody or you have to grow your own. And I'm like, okay, well, I want to grow them, but... I need a program and Napa put together a really good program. Look for an episode on that, by the way, uh, Amy, uh, Kirk. Profit sharing is the fastest way to grow technicians. It's not even, I have eight technicians at my shop and three of them are basically homegrown and the, the, the maturation process is so dramatically accelerated when every technician in your building is in their best interest to help the next guy. And more specifically the youngest greenest guy, Let's get him as many skills as we possibly can, as fast as we can. Um, And oh, by the way, that young green guy doesn't get to come in and be a kid. He has to come in and act like a professional because he's working with seven other people who are trying to pay their mortgages. Um, Yeah, they they learn real quick. It's a the it flattens the learning curve quite a bit. I mean, it's still steep, but it flattens it quite a bit. So, I'm very excited to learn about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me too. I'm looking forward to it. Sure. So, how do we get that? Well, you just sent ten dollars in an envelope, postage paid envelope. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll discuss this. We'll discuss this offline. Hey, I have to tell you something. Um, this was great. Uh, I know we moved thinking. Uh, I, I think we may have moved some people to action. Uh, thank you for the emotion. Thank you for the transparency. Thank you for your friendship. Thank you for the great wisdom and advice. Celebrating our 500th milestone. Wait till you see what we have planned this year. <laughs> Thank you so much to Amy Matnat from Auto Craftsman in Vermont, where it snows all the time. Judy yeah, Zimmerman snow. Walter, <laughs> Zimmerman's Automotive down in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. Good to have you here, Judy. You're always a, such a great contributor to the show and a good friend. Jerry Gaziah, the auto shop in Texas, who he, he blames his wife for everything that's wrong at the shop now. <laughs> Oh, stop it. <laughs> Brett Beachler, Beachler's uh, Vehicle Care and Auto Repair in Illinois. Thank you for that uh, very, very emotional thing there. Moving, uh, Brett. yes. Kirk Richardson, South Street Auto Care, Michigan. Your second shop this year, right? I just bought two in the last month. Oh, boy. All right. Uh, Not one, but two. <laughs> I love yeah. it. Uh, the opportunity for Good right. for you. <laughs> And my really, really exceptionally great friend who got me in to see George Bush at Apex this year, Dwayne Myers, Dynamic Automotive, Fredericksburg, Maryland. Thanks. Thanks, Carm. It's been great. Thanks for being on board to listen and learn from the premier automotive aftermarket podcast. Until next time. 